All right, folks, back here at uh, at the Space Symposium. Really excited to talk to folks today. And, of course, the folks I'm usually the most excited to talk to are our friends at Goon Hilly. Sir, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure. Thanks, Angry. My name's Dave Keithley. I'm the Managing Director for Defense and Security at Goon Hilly. So thanks very much for your time today. So let's go ahead and talk about how things have changed. There's been a staff change, reorganization in terms of the types of services Goon Hilly provides. Please tell me about that. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, we've now divided into three business divisions. The first one is probably the one that we're most well known for, which is the deep space and lunar communications. So most recently, uh, some of the viewers might have been watching the Intuitive Machines live stream of uh, IM2 mission, and we got name checked at least three times on there. So we had a little cheer going out for that one. Um, so yeah, we continue to support uh, institutional customers such as NASA, ESA, ISRO, JAXA, and now like Intuitive Machines, more commercial partners as well. The second business division is, again, the more traditional commercial satellite communications. Um, so this could be antenna hosting, antenna leasing, but then providing smart hands engineering support for those antennas based at not just Goon Hilly, but also uh, the locations for our ComSat, our US subsidiary partners. Um, so they've got locations in Southbury, Connecticut, uh, and also in Santa Paula, California. And then the third one, which I think we're going to delve into a little bit more, is the defense and security side. Um, so I was brought on to the company in September last year. I retired from the Royal Air Force and was doing space for about 20 years in the Royal Air Force. Uh, and I was brought on board RIDS to grow the defense and security portfolio for Goon Hilly. It's Cornish, Goon means down and Helhi means to hunt, so it means hunting downs. Goon Hilly is perfectly situated for uh, communications. We're in a very radio quiet area because we're on the uh, tip of the Lizard Peninsula. There's very low uh, houses and industry around, but we're also situated on the space crossroads where we can see the whole geostationary arc from 65 degrees east to 75 west and we're also situated on uh, serpentine bedrock, which is just below the soil. So that's perfect for uh, having our larger antennas like Goonhini 1, which is 1,100 tons. So it allows the uh, antenna to not subside into the ground. Well, fantastic. Very exciting indeed. And, and what an, a broadening of the scope. A lot of people just don't understand. They look upon Goon Hilly, they hear that name come up, and they just think that you're part of NASA's Deep Space Network, which you're not. You're an independent organization. If, if you can answer this question for me real quick, how have you been able to do this? Your, your funding has always been so limited, and you're essentially rebuilding an old British telecom facility. Give me a little insight as to how you pull this off on such a limited budget. Well, I, I, if I had to sum it up in one word, I'd probably say ingenuity. So when I arrived in the company, obviously you, you talk to lots of people, you, you look around the facilities, and when I saw the depth of RF hardware engineering expertise, software engineering expertise, I saw assets that were underutilized, I started to think about how could we use these in different sorts of ways for defense and security applications. But there was one program that had been running for a number of years before I arrived, and that was uh, a part of a technology demonstration program with the UK Ministry of Defense Research Organization called DSTL. And that was to uh, convert one of our communications antennas into a deep space radar for space domain awareness. Um, so this is one of our main programs right now, is to try and bring that to market with some further investment so that we can see what's going on in GEO. And that will give us, hopefully, a day-night, all-weather, 24-7 detection capability out to geostationary orbit and beyond potentially into cis lunar, uh, although we're still at the early stages of developing the system. My favorite vehicle or spacecraft that we tracked is probably Mars Express because that was our first spacecraft and that was my first operational pass that we did. iSpace is Hakuto R Mission 1. That was launched um, in December 2022. One of the most fascinating ones I think would be Mars Express just because it's orbiting Mars. It also carried the Beagle 2 lander which is the British Mars lander. Uh, we've also tracked BioSentinel uh, which had yeast on board to investigate the impact of space radiation on living organisms. So we're talking about providing defensive capability all the way at, out, out into orbit, keeping our satellites safe from, say, anti-sat weapons, that sort of thing. Is, is that what we're looking at here? Uh, that's one part of the whole picture, but you need to include the civil security side as well. So it could be uh, for 
monitoring licenses um, to make sure that people are transmitting on the right frequencies, are in the correct orbital slots. It could be about space flight safety, making sure that there's no debris. So for example, uh, we witnessed the Intel SAT uh, 33 breakup. Um, so, of course, that caused great consternation within the satellite operator community. And it's those sorts of things that need early detection. Uh, they need very exquisite data to make sure that they can mitigate the impacts of those events. So, one more question for you here. In regards to the changing geopolitical situation, have you found that there are more opportunities available for Goon Hilly now that Europe has become uh, more interested in, in sovereign capability? Well, I'd say it's probably a very leading question. Before I talk about what potential opportunities it might have created, um, based on sort of the military experience I've had working alongside both US Air Force and then later US Space Force personnel, I have to say that nothing that's happening right now in the, in the political sphere will um, have any impact upon the military relationships. They are uh, extremely deep relationships and we have to be able to operate side by side with our, our US counterparts. Um, in terms of the opportunity, absolutely yes, it's created opportunity. Um, I think it's forced the UK government to think again about what are its sovereignty requirements? Um, what does it mean in terms of having its own national security and defence capability to protect and defend the assets that the UK has in space. And so I guess my plea to the UK government would, would be, yes, you need to spend more on, on space domain awareness to protect and defend the assets that we have there. Uh, and we, it's quite promising because we've seen recently uh, requests for proposals coming out in the area of space domain awareness. So it's it's good opportunity for us. Fantastic. Well, once again, always a pleasure to talk to Goon Hilly. Really appreciate your time. And of course, I wish you all the best and I hope I can come out and visit you folks in the near future. Yep, you're always welcome. And I know that you try and sign off saying stay angry about space, but we're British, so maybe slightly annoyed about space. <laughs> much better, much better indeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, folks, the, uh, the journey here at Space Symposium continues, and we are back with our old friends at Spaceport Cornwall, perhaps one of our oldest friends on this channel. Thanks for joining us today. Would you be so kind to introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, thanks so much, Jordan. Yeah, my name's Ross. I'm the head of engagement at Spaceport Cornwall, um, and as Jordan says, we've been friends many years. Uh, Jordan supported us on the launch as well back in 2023, and um, been great to follow your journey as well as you support us on ours. So tell me, you've had some, some changes in staff, that sort of thing recently. Tell me about how, how things are going currently and how things are moving towards the future with the spaceport in the aftermath of the things that happen with Virgin Orbit, et cetera. Yeah, so obviously the, the thing with Virgin Orbit wasn't uh, foreseen. So um, the good news is that in the two years since the launch, we've been successful in attracting businesses onto the site, which of course commercially is really important, it pays our way. Um, we also took the opportunity to concentrate not just on launch, but on future air activity as well. So potentially drones, hypersonic stuff, you know, things that are in the space domain, but also not. So we're dealing with the, the Department for Transport and also the Civil Aviation, Civil Aviation Authority in both their traditional aviation and space teams. Um, so, and the, the, the new uh, recruit that you mentioned, so we've just appointed a future head of, uh, a head of future air and space. So that's basically doing exactly what I just said. So concentrating on the launch, bringing back launch to Cornwall, probably still looking at a, a sort of year to 18 months for that but now working with those future air operators as well and just maximizing the opportunity that Spaceport Cornwall has because we're not just a spaceport, we're a licensed passenger airport, we're an aerodrome, we've got one of the longest runways in the UK or right by the ocean with sort of um, access to really unique airspace. So you just want to provide a sandbox or whatever you call it for to enable that future airspace that we're hoping we'll get to.
Now, of course, we know about space engine systems and their hypersonic orbital space plane. Um, can you, number one, tell us about uh, how things have been developing with them. Number two, uh, Sierra Space is kind of off the radar a bit. They're not here at Symposium, et cetera. Have you been hearing anything from them because they were going to make use of your facilities in the future? Yeah, so Space Engine Systems are here. Um, so they've had a testing facility at Spaceport Cornwall for nearly two years now. Um, and they've had some challenges exporting their engine over to the UK to do first some testing and then hopefully some flight trials. Um, the good news is that now that has cleared export. So that is on its way. So we're all very excited about, and they're recruiting locally as well. So the team are based in our building full time. So I get regular updates. What they do. Of course, I ask them every day, when's the engine getting here? Um, and Pradeep, the CEO is here. And just as I was leaving this, symposium yesterday he ran up to me very excitedly to sort of reiterate that the engine is is coming so um, that's really important for them because they've been talking to the regulator in the UK for a while now and you know and they're interested to know how they can support um, and of course it's the sort of activity that people expect to see at a spaceport so um, and you know it's, it's very exciting a single stage to orbit space plane you know that's like it's as exciting as it gets In regards to Sierra Space, yeah, they don't have a stand here, but their staff are here. So there's meetings going on. We're still engaging with them. Um, we have had their permission to, well, for a while now, to speak to potential European customers for a European return launch, and that's still the case. Of course, they are concentrating on achieving that first launch out of the US. It's a little bit like when we're in the same case with Virgin Orbit. They want to do it in their home, in their home country first. So we sort of are waiting in the wings we're also doing some work because it's a, you know, it's a different technology to Virgin Orbit, so we need to change our license. That's probably a nine-month process to go with the regulator. So, you know, we're not sort of like pushing them too hard. We're supporting, we're cheering them on. We'll be excited to see Dream Chaser achieve that launch. And then hopefully, um, once their, their focus moves on to their international partners, we'll be um, one of the, the first to hopefully support mission. Very exciting. So in terms of, uh, of course, you've heard recently about the things that happened at Saxavort, but also things that are happening um, in Andoya and the fact that they managed to lift off from there, etc. But going back to Saxavort and the fact that they got CAA clearance for just about everything as well, Rocket Factory Augsburg got most of their licensing, if not all of it at this point. Have you found that the CAA is learning? Are they getting better at this than they were before? Yeah, and it's interesting. So I was chatting to Colin from the CAA, head of space policy, yesterday and of course we managed to achieve that first launch out of Cornwall in January 23 but I think all parties will acknowledge that we never want to do it like that again but that's just what happens isn't it you know the safety case was 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 really big of course you know it, which it had to be and we were able to facilitate that because the airport is owned by the council but you know we had to close down the airport we had to evict tenants we had to close roads and it was and it was definitely worth it it was a huge celebration a historic moment but you're not going to be doing that if you're going to be launching a sex of order like you know once a week or once a month um so yeah the the, the process has vastly improved sex of order have benefited from that and we'd like to hope that when we do our next launch in a year to 18 months we'll benefit again and it's been really i mean the sex Award guys are brilliant we've always supported them um, and it's been really great to see their launch vehicle operators sort of do some of their tests you know the recent isar launch out of andoya um rocket factory Altsburg. And, you know, it's just, we've always been a really, I mean, the space is a small industry globally. The space is a very small industry when you think about the UK. So absolutely brilliant to see their success. Um, and, you know, really excited for them. Uh, last, last question. This is the same question I asked your colleague over at Goon Hilly. 
and you may not be able to answer this, but given the shifting geopolitical situation right now, have you, do you see more opportunity for Spaceport Cornwall now that Britain seems to be recognizing that sovereign launch capability is important? Well, that's obviously the case, isn't it? We started this program because we wanted sovereign launch capability. That was before the situation in Ukraine. That was before some of the changes that have been happening with um, in the US at the moment. But so more important than ever, you know, in though when we started it, it was a, we didn't want to be over reliant on our friends and neighbours. And perhaps now it's a case of not wanting to be over reliant on some um, areas of the world that perhaps is, is a bit uncertain. So maybe there is an opportunity for us. It's certainly making us have closer conversations with some of our European colleagues. Um, but hopefully it's, it's not our either or. I mean, we still want to be able to offer US partners launch site resilience. Um, but yeah, I mean, potentially an opportunity um, and yeah, certainly speaking to some of our European partners a lot more closely than we maybe were a couple of years ago. Ross, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. All the best. Brilliant.